Nope. All the tapes have been destroyed by the director. The network has scrubbed all mention and hype of my show from the internet. My Facebook page is gone. Twitter erased. I guess I should be lucky they aren't trying to erase me, too. Either way, what happened will only live on in my words now. Everyone seems content to pretend nothing occurred. But I can't get it out of my mind. I feel almost compelled to talk about it. So here I am. To be truthful, I am an actor, first and foremost. I have always believed in the supernatural and done a lot of personal research, but I'm no expert. Still, I was happy to play the part of an expert ghost hunter on TV. The format was simple. I would visit a haunted home owned and lived in by regular people. I mainly just interviewed them and then gave them a solution or performed an exorcism depending on what we thought the problem was. We put the word out on social media that we wanted to hear from anyone who suspected they currently lived in a haunted house. Out of the 1,230 promising candidates, the producers came up with a list of 40 families to visit. From them, we were hoping to get enough footage to fill 13 episodes for our first season. All of the homeowners provided enough information beforehand that I shouldn't have to ask any questions I didn't already know the answer to. And research aides had gone through it all so I could give a realistic solution to their problems. We even hired a real priest to help craft our exorcism rites. Ironically, it was the most legit television program I have ever worked on. Certainly, the homeowners thought it all real. We had visited six families without any problems. I ended up using the strongest exorcism rites for most of the homes. Not because we were worried about what might happen in their homes. It was just good TV. In fact, there was no sign of paranormal activity while I visited, but the cameraman stayed behind to get a lot of B-roll that post-production could work their magic with. The families themselves were pleasant and very ordinary. Exactly what we wanted. That is, until we went to visit the seventh family. The Conley family. Ward and Donna Conley lived with their infant daughter, Angela, in Tallahassee, Florida. Ward was the first to contact us, but he and his wife both supplied a detailed history of their time living together. I read all the material the night before going to their house, and I was fascinated with what I found. At first glance, their story was pretty basic. They had lived together in the home for just three years without incident, but things changed when Angela came into their lives. Ever since, there had been books falling out of bookcases, lights flickering, TV channels changing, relatively harmless stuff like that. All I planned on doing was filming the interview and using the most basic ghost banishing technique of a firm reprimand. Simply telling a minor nuisance of a ghost to quote, leave this place and never return is allegedly effective. We figured having a breather episode would help the series as a whole. However, my plans changed when I looked at the photos my research aides provided. Donna Conley was, without exaggeration, the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. 
I will not do her features any justice by trying to describe them in any great detail. Just know that she, surely, turned the heads of everyone she passed by. By comparison, Ward Conley was a stain on humanity. Not that I would fare any better being compared to Donna's looks, but I was genuinely confused as to how such a plain man managed to attract such an enviable mate. Like a man possessed, I went back through every scrap of information I had received about this family for answers. I knew his job, and because of the neighborhood they lived in, I knew Donna couldn't have been with him for the money. After another hour of rereading their bios, I finally decided to just ask them more about their relationship when I saw them in person. Either way, I resolved to get answers, but I needed a break. I started up my research on mythical creatures again, and ended up sleeping in my armchair with about 15 Wikipedia tabs open on my laptop. Despite the unexpectedly late night, I was eager to start the next day, and practically dragged my director to the airport. We met the camera crew in Florida, and made a beeline to the Conley home. When Donna opened the door, I found myself speechless. Her picture had not prepared me for how utterly gorgeous she was in real life. After letting my director introduce me, I had recovered just enough to stammer a meek, hello. I was actually worried about how I'd get through the interview, but it turned out that I would have to do most of the talking with Ward as Donna soon busied herself with attending to their daughter. Ward explained his theory that the ghost of his aunt was unhappy with the birth of their daughter, having always wanted a nephew, but dying before Ward had ever even met Donna. Trying to stay professional, I jumped at the chance to ask, How did you meet Donna? He told me a disappointingly normal tale about the two of them being classmates who never spoke. Then they became co-workers at a bank together. After a couple of years of working together, Ward finally worked up the courage to ask her out. Donna graced us with her presence just in time to chime. And the rest, as they say, is history. Even that tired cliché sounded like the most delightful church bells in her voice. I happily took the tea and apple pie she was offering to us and to the rest of the crew. It was the most delicious dessert I could remember having, but I expected nothing less from Donna at this point. And yet she was stuck here with simple, average ward. I just couldn't understand why. Ward continued to prattle on about how his slippers never seemed to be where he last remembered putting them. I tried to focus on his words, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something wrong about this whole situation. I moved on to ask more questions about Donna, but Ward became uncomfortable and evasive. At the time, I wondered what he was trying to hide. My director held up the script I had memorized the night before and pointed to it while still behind the cameraman. Reluctantly, I started asking questions about his aunt. But then Ward indirectly gave me a huge clue. He revealed that while his aunt really did want a nephew, he had always assumed she had just been concerned that Ward would die alone. I asked him if that had been a real concern, and he laughed. Apparently his whole family had worried since he had remained dateless throughout his schooling. He told me that their concerns had always been unwarranted, he simply had been focusing on his studies intentionally and he didn't make a big deal about his girlfriends when he did start dating. As a matter of fact, 
he had been dating Donna for ages before he introduced her to his family. To them, the answer to their prayers just appeared out of thin air. Something about the way he said that jogged my memory of the night before. I suddenly realized what was going on. I was convinced this was a real supernatural event before us. I had been reading about tulpas, spirits caused by intense desire and belief. Normally, it would take a great number of people believing in the same thing to make it real. But if one person had an intense enough desire, it could conjure that desire out of thin air. It almost made too much sense. Donna was too good to be true. And her being here would make the veil to the spirit world weaker wherever she was. At least that's what I read. She could inadvertently be behind the haunting. Of course, I had no idea what to do next. I let Ward do most of the talking while my own mind raced. On one hand, I could potentially prove the existence of the supernatural on camera. On the other hand, if I performed the exorcism, I would erase Donna and I could barely stand thinking about that. But then again, it wasn't like Donna could ever be my own anyway. Just then, Donna entered while rocking Angela in a blanket. I had forgotten about their baby. It's not like a tulpa could conceive. Since I was back to square one, I asked Ward if we could take a break. I stood up and walked over to Donna, as though I was more interested in Angela. I directed the cameraman to get some footage of the baby. I was disappointed to see none of Donna's remarkableness in Angela. I commented that the baby obviously took after Ward, and Donna gave me a wistful look but just agreed. Intrigued, I pressed her for the meaning behind the look, and she finally explained. Oh, she's not my biological daughter. Ward popped up with an angry look as he stammered. D d don't don't use that. I want that cut out of the show. I was angry too. Even though this meant I was right about Donna, I couldn't believe Ward could have just used her like this. In hindsight, he could have used a surrogate since a tulpa couldn't get pregnant. But all I could think of at the time is that he cheated on her. Impulsively, I started chanting the strongest exorcism rite I knew while staring at Donna. If I couldn't have her, I would at least make sure Ward couldn't have her either. No one fully realized what was going on, so no one stopped me. The cameras rolled on. But when I finished, Donna did not disappear. She remained before me, clutching a now empty blanket. She screamed. I stood there like an idiot. My director and the rest of the crew just stood there confused. It took them minutes to even comprehend that the child was gone. Donna sank to her knees and hugged the blanket tight. Her face contorted with pain. Tears flowed endlessly, and her screams became hoarse howls of despair. I'll never forget the absolute agony she embodied just then. I had erased something that she had brought into existence through sheer desire. Her suffering was at least as great. Ward was wailing too, but soon grabbed me and yelled, Bring her back! Bring my daughter back! 
It wasn't until he started punching me that the crew finally intervened. They dragged me out of there. I was sent home. And that was that. All proof of the supernatural was buried, and I'll never work in Hollywood again. Within three months, I heard that Ward and Donna had begun divorce proceedings, but he committed suicide before it became official. Donna currently resides in a mental hospital after she attempted a self-lobotomy. I've thought about rescuing her from there, but honestly, I can't look at her the same after I've seen how ugly she looks while crying. I guess she wasn't perfect, after all. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this week's video. If you did, you know what to do. Drop an elbow onto that like button. It is one of the strongest parts of the body, after all. Just snap that thing in half. Shout out to the author of this story, Joshua Andrew. I have to say, Mr. Andrew, I did not see this twist coming in this story, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, so great work. In addition to the standard Reddit profile page link and a link to the original No Sleep post, I will include a link to their ebook that you can purchase on Amazon, The Lonely Twin, and 33 Other Tales to Trouble You Tomorrow. That's the name of the book. Check that out if you're interested. And uh, yeah, let them know that you liked this story if you did. Until next time, everybody, remember to stay safe out there. I'll be seeing you in the next video.